Hi guys, in this video I want to talk about an article that came out today and it's about states bracing for a change, potential change, to the $600 a week um, unemployment benefit that the federal government added due to COVID. Now just a reminder, um, we see unemployment benefits at the state level traditionally. So if you become unemployed, you apply to the state, you then get a benefit from the state. The federal government was not directly involved in that. However, because of COVID, the federal government started augmenting whatever state benefits you get with a $600 a week check. Now, what this has achieved is a much more stable financial environment for households that have become unemployed. The unintended consequence of this, however, is it's disincentivized people from becoming employed. And you can think about the mathematics here. Normally with unemployment, you get a fraction of your pre-unemployment paycheck. Okay? Um, you don't get the full amount. You certainly don't get more. However, with this $600 a week unemployment benefit from the federal government, there are people that are making a hundred percent. There's even some people that are making more than a hundred percent of their income. I've even heard stories that there's some individuals that make the federal minimum wage in their job. They're getting almost double being unemployed from the federal government than they would what they would get if they went back to work. Now you think about that. Say, well, why would someone want to go back to work? Um, let's say you're a dishwasher for a restaurant. Why would you want to go back to work as a dishwasher at a restaurant to make less money than if you stay at home and don't work? So that's the conundrum that the government has created. And it was maybe good intended, but it's creating some unintended results. And that often happens when we study economics. We, we look at not only the intended effects, but we look at those that we didn't intend. And when you do that, you get a fuller picture and a much longer term um, perspective on the consequences of policies. Um, so this is the problem that they're in now. And let's scroll down a little bit here. Um, I want to show you this chart here. Um, unemployment has increased. Actually, let me pull up the um, trading economics unemployment applications. We talked about this in another video. Um, this shows the number of people that applied for unemployment in a particular week. So if we go back, let's say one year, you can see that there was, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, let's, let's just say around 150, 200,000 people would apply for unemployment each week. And then we get to March and April and May, and it just skyrockets all the way up to, you know, five, six, even seven million people applying each week. And then it's dropped off as the lockdowns have subsided and employers have re-employed a lot of people. But we're still around, um, you know, a hundred uh, or a million each week. And that's important to keep in mind because, pull this up here again, if you look at just the past several weeks, 1.4 million is the most recent. That's the number of people that became unemployed in that week. 1.3, 1.3, 1.4. So even though it's dropped off since May, we still have a high number of unemployed um, compared to traditionally around 100 to 200,000 a week. So keep that in mind because with this many people continuing to file for unemployment, unemployment is becoming a major expense. Now let's go back to the article. This chart here shows federal unemployment benefit payments by week ending. You'll notice if we go back to, uh, let's look at February. In February, they were spending uh, 0.69 billion, uh, so about $690 million on unemployment uh, benefits. However, that goes in April to 11 billion, that goes in the height of June 26, we were at $26 billion. So it's become a very expensive program. Now you might be saying, but the federal government has a lot of money, right? So what are we worried about? 
Well, that's right. The federal government does have a lot of money, but they get that money from us. In other words, the federal government itself has no money. They have to get it from us, and they do that in taxation. Okay, so if we see larger amounts of unemployment going out to people, then we would expect to have higher taxes in the future. Now, we also have another route for the government to get money, and that is they can print it. By now, you should understand that that doesn't bring about a free lunch either, because if you tax people, it's obvious that you're taking money away from them. So people will feel the expense of whatever the government is buying uh, through taxation. You'll see it uh, as you're uh, earning income and it's getting taken away. But what if they just print the money? Well, when they do that, we don't see any money coming out of our checks. But remember, when you print money, you create inflation. And the inflation means goods become more expensive. And that means that whatever money you do earn, it has less value. So when the government is spending more money on whatever, this is just one example. This is just unemployment compensation. I mean, the government spends money on a lot of things. But when the government is spending more money on anything, it's either going to be paid for by the people through higher taxes, or it's going to be paid for by the people through higher prices. In both cases, the burden of that spending does fall on the people. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it is a thing. And, and that's critical because a lot of times when they, see, when people see the government spending money, they don't think about what that means in terms of costs. It's easy to see the benefits of that spending, right? You see all the unemployment checks going out and all the people getting paid um, when they're unemployed and they're able to buy food and they're able to pay their rent and all of this kind of stuff. And that's all very good. The benefits are clear. But as economists, we also have to see the cost of that and that people are going to have to pay for that, either through higher taxes or through um, increased inflation in the future. The famous saying is there's no such thing as a free lunch, and it's true with government spending. Now, that just helps us better evaluate uh, what type of government spending we want and whether it's worth the money or not. Don't assume that because the government spends money that you're not going to to have to bear some of the burden of that. Okay, so how is the government attempting to deal with this um, disincentive to go back to work? Well, the expiration of the current $600 a week supplement is July 31st. So we are rapidly approaching the end of this program, which means that the um, uh, representatives in Washington need to get together to either uh, replace this program with something else or prepare for um, the end of the program and the consequences that come from that. I mean, obviously, if they just let it uh, expire, then you're going to have people that are getting an extra $2,400 a month that are going to lose that instantly. That would provide a strong incentive to go back to work, but it would leave a lot of people that can't get work without an income. So that's unlikely. The article talks about moving from a $600 flat payment down to a $400 flat payment. Um, and uh, that's probably more likely than letting the program expire. Uh, something, you know, to that tune, maybe they go from 600 to 500 or 600 to 300, whatever the numbers are, a reduction is likely. Another part of the article talks about the potential for just capping the, um, the unemployment benefit to your pre-unemployment income. In other words, there's no way you could make more than 100% of what you made uh, when you were employed. Now, that one is not as much of an incentive because when you think about it, if somebody is not working um, and they're getting the same amount that they could get working, well, it's really not the same because um, when you are working, you have to actually do a job. Now, maybe you love your job, and I'm sure there's some people out there that would say, well, I'd rather be at work than be at home. But for a lot of people, they'd rather be at home. They'd rather be able to get the income without the hassle of having to work. And even, again, if you do love your job and you, you maybe you like your coworkers and there's, you know, all the social element of being at work, um, there's also a lot of issues that come with work beyond the job. I mean, 
you know, when you when you're working, you you have to maybe get up early in the morning. Uh, you have to do your hair. You have to shave or put makeup on. Or you know, you have to maybe dry clean your clothes. You got to buy gas for the car. You have to drive to work and deal with maybe traffic. In other words, there are a lot of negative um, elements to working that that wouldn't come with you know unemployment that wouldn't be there uh, at, at home. Um, so uh, there's an attractiveness to getting the money and not going to work that it's hard to change. And that's the dilemma that the government is in. How do you adjust these benefits or um, change the amount of money that people get um, in order to get them to, to want to look for work, to want to go back to work? Okay, Because there's an important component here. Our economy doesn't grow when people are unemployed. And that means that whatever is produced is divvied up among more people, which means people get less on average. That's the adverse effects of a recession and unemployment is, you know, you're, you're shrinking the pie, but we all still have to eat. And so the provisions get less on average. And uh, we want to avoid that. We want to get people back to work um, and we want to get them incentivized when they have the opportunity to work to actually do so. Okay. Um, all right. I'll leave it there. If you have questions, let me know. Thanks, guys.